Neil Hallinan, you are most welcome to the Happy Habit podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Now, to those who aren't familiar with you, let me give them a brief summary of your qualifications, if I can. You are a Postural Restoration Institute credentialed strength and conditioning coach. That's a mouthful. A licensed massage therapist and a personal trainer. Uh, you've also become a bit of a YouTube star. Where, where is, That's exactly where I found you in recent weeks. And your videos really opened my eyes when I was watching them. And it's an understatement, I think, to say that your viewers have been more than impressed by your approach to human body mechanics, movement and posture. Now, when I think of posture, I think of the Alexander technique, I suppose many people would. And I think of my mother's voice in the back of my head saying, sit up straight, you're slouching. I think everybody can probably relate to that. Talk to me about posture. Why is posture so important? Posture is so important because it reflects a few things that that most people are not really actually thinking of. Because as your grandmother used to say, you know, stand up and put your shoulders back, you have to, that's always the classic wisdom. But in reality, for most people, all that really does is make things a little bit worse because it's putting them into this state of what we call extension. It's when you have an overarched back, an increased lordosis in your back, and over time that'll tip your pelvis forward, uh, which people will call an anterior pelvic tilt on one or both sides. And that's the big difference, one or both sides, because our right side and our left side are not remotely the same. And it'll bring your head forward into a more of a forward head posture where you start to have hyperactivity of your neck muscles. So posture really reflects a few things from my perspective your vision, your visual system, your auditory system. And this is going to sound funny, but your apprehension or what you like or what you dislike, which doesn't really, and then how you breathe. But those last two, actually, they all go together. That's the funny, that's the interesting thing. All of these things, because it's orientation. It's, it's once you're upright, once organisms became upright and moved, you have to keep moving and your brain's your brain's desire is to keep you moving forward exploring your environment without falling down without bumping into things and without getting eaten so how we stand up and how we move is really it's much less muscular what it really is is neurological and you have to take and that what i that's what i think has been lost as long, well, I think it's always been never really acknowledged until posture restoration really started to fill in these gaps. It's in the literature, which is the odd thing. It's just that it's never been condensed into, you know, an overall better understanding of what posture really is. But in terms of how people stand and posture themselves, which is a behavioral thing, uh, it's really about what you're seeing, what you're hearing, because your bl- your brain is blind. It's guessing. So when you're looking at me right now. Uh, it's guessing as to what I look like because it's interpreting frequencies of light bouncing off of me, which go back to your retina. And then your retina, this magical thing happens where your brain returns an image to you, but it's still your brain's best guess as to what's out there. It's not really the reality. That's why you can see a mirage uh, thinking you see something, but in reality it was something else because your brain is still guessing as to what's out there. But our, once we're upright and our blind brain has to figure out where we are in space, where we are in relation to the ground, and then how to deal with gravity. That's pulling, that's a neurosensory activity. That's a neurosensory event. And the muscles are only doing what the brain is telling it to do based off of incoming sensory input. So the sensory input comes in, your brain processes it and produces the muscular output. And that muscular output is what we call posture, but you really can't change someone's posture just by focusing on the muscular output. It's the incoming sensory input and the processing that has to be changed. That's how postural restoration works. We do work with muscles and we do work with breathing because that's our way into the nervous system. But what we're really doing is having people sense things that they've lost sense of which is kind of sounds kind of strange, but because we're asymmetrically designed and we have the bigger right diaphragm, we have a visual system that that prefers to pay attention to visual space on the right rather than on the left. 
uh, and just the way the brain functions, we're just right dominant humans. And that lateralization of right, right, right is built into us. And that's not even, that's, that's, there's books on lateralization. That's, you can find that in the scientific literature, like right eye, right ear, right hand, right foot. That's normal lateralization. So we are right dominant humans. Now, not everyone's going to be that, but they're still going to have a bigger right diaphragm and they're still going to have a brain that pays more attention to the visual space on the right than on the left. So that inherent asymmetry of our organ placement and muscles and how our brain pays attention to the world, the visual world, makes us more right dominant than we realize. So people might know about right eye, right ear, right hand. There's a reason 90% of the world throws with the right hand or kicks with the right foot. It's the norm. However, this right dominance plays itself out in posture and movement more than we realize. Can we talk about natural patterns of movement? I know you're passionate about this. Can, yeah. can you just give us your thoughts on that? So th some people say there's a lot of ways to move. Uh, maybe there is, but there would be one right way and then compensation. So we have a right, a dominant right side. That's not a problem. Our asymmetry is not a problem. And there's books written about asymmetry. I have a couple in my, in my bookshelf about asymmetry and they can be found. Uh, it's not a problem to have a dominant side. It gives you an easy way to start. You don't have to think about, hey, which, start, which side should I start with to, to initiate my walk? You're just gonna do it. You're just gonna start to use your right side more than the left side just because of how we're, how we're built. Uh, but in terms of natural movement, once someone's, when, I remember when I say posture, we're definitely not talking about shoulders, you know, back. We're talking about how your brain is perceiving the world and how it's instructing your muscles to move in relation to that world. Uh, that, that natural movement breaks down for a variety of reasons. Injuries and insult to the body can be a couple of them. Uh, a, a visual system that is not working properly, that has two eyes that are not working coherently, vestibular issues, anything, when these types of issues happen and you start to become unstable in your body, you're going to stay more on the right side until the point that you pretty much drop off your left side. You'll still put your weight on your left leg, but it's gonna be in compensation. You're never gonna do it in a true biomechanical sense. So when people, when the, when the organism is threatened, the natural movement stops and it becomes compensatory. So even if someone is psychologically distressed because they COVID, every PRI therapist I know has, has, has kind of talked about the same issue that, man, people's issues got a lot worse during COVID, during lockdowns, because of the tension being created inside that body and that brain was being exhibited in the body. And it's really just what we're dealing with is, is when people become unstable, and that happens in very predictable places, and that's going to be the left side, the left hip is going to become very unstable. 90% of people that come to see me have an unstable left hip. How do you determine that? There's tests that we have to, to, to show the instability. Uh, and that once the body becomes unstable, you have to tighten up in other areas. So once the left hip becomes unsta unstable, you have to tighten up in other areas to help protect you so you don't fall because of that destabilized left side. And that's really the science of posture restoration is trying to figure out uh, how to get that brain to trust that left side again. And once we lose that left side or your left hip becomes unstable, uh, there's a whole series of physiological and structural and biomechanical chain of events that occur. One being you're going to become a neck breather. You're going to lose your diet, your ability to breathe with your, in particular, your left diaphragm. And you start to neck breathe and you start to use your back to breathe. And now you've got compounded issues, that instability then led to compensatory breathing habits that lock you into this mispositioned posture even further. So the natural movement uh, breaks down very quickly once you become unstable through your left hip. And I would say 90% of people that come to see me for pain have that unstable left hip. And um, yeah, so that, so the natural movement, which is asymmetric, we're never going to be symmetric, but there's a range of safety a range of variability that we have, but once we become unstable, then we become compensatory and we start to overuse these very common muscles that people always want to stretch out like hip flexors in your lower back. They're being used to help stabilize an unstable system. And that becomes problematic because that just holds you in this problematic position. 
Okay, so let me pick that uh, apart then. So just as people uh, can try to understand, you mentioned a neurological component. Yeah. Is the neurological component always the origin of posture issues or can it be biomechanical, which then feeds into a neurological component? And both. the two of them yeah, combine right. that really, to give... You really can't separate them. So you right. really can't separate sensory inputs from the muscular outputs that are then produced. It's always happening constantly. So... It can happen either way, uh, but once something changes, you're going to, so if you lose stability somewhere, you have to find it somewhere else. And so the moment someone starts to become unstable, particularly through that left hip, their body weight will start to shift over to the right side a little bit more. Now, some people will say, no, I feel my weight on my left leg. And they might, they might say, wait, I'm on my left leg, but it's never biomechanically correct they're stabilizing their left leg, their weight might be shifted more to the left and to the right. But the testing will always show that their orientation of their body is still to the right. And so any test that I show on my peer on my um, YouTube channel, anytime I show testing, those are all tests like shoulder tests or leg tests. Those are tests that are telling us whether that brain and body are oriented to the right or lying more in the center. So uh, if you have a neurological event, if your vision starts to fail, if you, you start to lose hearing in one ear compared to the other, things have to change. The brain has to start to compensate one way or another to make up for that lost sense. And so you can now start to have one eye that's really paying attention to the distance and one eye that's kind of looking up close more. Uh, you, it, there's a lot of ways that it plays out. Um, and so you really can't separate the mechanical from the neurological because it's the same system. What are the reasons do we know for our being, most of us being right side dominant? Are there any evolutionary reasons for that to be the case? Probably, there's a great book on that called The Master and His Emissary. I would highly recommend by uh, Ian McGilchrist. It's all about the lateralization of the brain. Oh, it was going to be a brain thing. Now the, the bigger right diaphragm is, is there. So the bigger, the diaphragm, most people don't even realize you have two diaphragms and I didn't either until I found posture restoration. But in fact, you do have two and they're two separate muscles and they have different behaviors. The right diaphragm is more easily used for breathing. The left diaphragm, which is smaller, it does have the breathing aspect to it, but for people who become too right dominant, that left diaphragm becomes more of a postural stabilizer. And that's actually in the, you can actually find studies on that. That's not a PRI idea. That's, that's actually can be found in the literature. It's just that posture restoration has, has kind of shown what that looks like through these testings. And that's kind of, that is the basis of PRI is that this asymmetry and this smaller left diaphragm makes it more likely that we're going to overuse our right side. But I think in terms of hemispheric differences in the brain, I think a big one would be the language that the language is that our language that language is mostly on the left side of the brain. And there's strong links between language and the right hand, our ability to use oh, our okay. right hand. And it's covered in that Ian McGillicrist book quite a bit. Very so, interesting. Okay, okay, so how does poor posture most commonly manifest itself? What do you see most of? I would say it's, how does it manifest? I would say the fact that we sit at such a young age. It's very difficult to not start to neck breathe or back breathe when you're sitting too much. Sitting like, so they put kids in school at a very young age and you sit at desks. Sitting is not the norm for the human body. The brain needs to move. There's many neuroscience and you can find them on YouTube. You can find books on this, that the point, the only reason that humans need a complex brain is to manage complex movement. Uh, there's, I think his name is Ted Wolpert, something along those lines. He's on, he, he has a YouTube, um, you know, he has a, a Ted talk where he talks about this issue that really the only reason you need a, you need a brain is to, to, to manage complex movement. And he talks about how a sea squirt, when a sea squirt is born, uh, it's, it, it swims, but then when it finds itself, when it finds a place to attach itself to, and it just sits on a rock for the rest of its life, it devours its own nervous system because it doesn't need it anymore. 
It is needed, yeah. Oh, so we need a brain. So when we're not moving is our natural state. You have to think about hunters and gatherers. How did the human body and brain evolve? In what setting? And it wasn't sitting. It certainly wasn't sitting in a chair. <laughs> squatting, squatting's normal. But because we sit in chairs at something at such a young age, our very flexible bodies start to not be so flexible. <laughs> and so the other problem is staring at screens so much. So I, I would say that the two biggest issues for posture related issues these days, here I probably was not needed 40, 50 years ago, but because of the modern lifestyle of sedentary activity, sitting all day and lack of movement in general, you are constraining the human brain and the human body from what it's meant to do, which is move and not stare. Staring at screens, the effort that it takes to bring your eyes together and stare at a, a small screen is probably the reason why myopia is such is increasing so much in the world. Every optometrist knows that. They don't know anything about posture restoration, but because there's no PRI trained optometrist, but your eyes, your visual system is how you move. And when you only focus up close, your brain will start to drop off the distance. And now you've got a problem and that's going to affect your, 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 your posture. So I think most postural issues at this point in time are being driven by sedentary activity. Now, of course there's injuries and things like that, that will cause you to kind of tighten up your body as a way to stabilize. But in the absence of injury, in the absence of disease, sedentary lives, a brain that needs to process movement doesn't get to do it. And the effect of uh, that inactivity, we start to lose stability and we start to overuse our neck for breathing. And once your neck is overactive for any reason, besides looking around, it pulls you into this posture. Necks unground us. So when necks are overactive, they literally 23,000 times a day, how many times you breathe, that neck is going to pull your chest up away from the, up from the ground. And that starts to affect how your brain is sensing the ground. So I would say sedentary desk jobs and sitting and staring at computers and screens is, is one of the major um, underlying issues why people struggle with, with pain and tension that they can't figure out where it's coming from. It's funny, I was at the bus stop the other day waiting for a bus and there are lots of people, as is normally the case, uh, during any period of inactivity, they take out their phones and their heads are craned over their phones. And what I notice, certainly in, in myself and in other people, is that propensity to elongate the neck. So yeah. my neck now seems to be, or my head seems to be permanently forward. And I presume then if... If your head, which weighs a couple of pounds, if that's permanently forward because you're staring into your phone or your smartphone, well, then that will throw it the alignment then all the way down through through your spine then as well, I presume. And then uh, that would also affect then your breathing. You mentioned breathing earlier. Absolutely, because your diaphragms, the position, the function of your diaphragms, and it's always important, plural, you have two. And the right is much bigger than the left. It's not even remotely close if you actually look at a picture of them. It looks like one asymmetric muscle. <laughs> and that's kind of how you learn about it. But in fact, it's two different muscles and thus the asymmetry. So, but yeah, it, it, the, the diaphragms themselves, they are dependent upon the position of the rib cage and the spine and the position of the pelvis for their function. So if you're in a forward head posture, a lot of people know what a forward head posture is, right? The neck moves forward, the head just kind of goes with it. Once you're in that forward head posture, your neck, your neck has to become overactive just because you're pushing it forward. It's that you're going to flex your head. So your neck flexors, these sternocleidomastoids will become overactive, but your sternocleidomastoids are also part of the vagus system. They are, they are muscles that are innervated by cranial nerves. They are part of the vagus system. So by going into a forward head posture, you are upsetting the whole vagal system because now you can't rotate your head and you can't side bend your neck the way it should be because you're, a straight neck loses range of motion. And that's why it's so detrimental. That's why in posture restoration, it all comes back to the neck. Once someone's head and neck come forward, which they will happen as they start to overuse their neck for breathing and stabilization that they lost elsewhere. Once that happens, you get, you get stuck in this cycle of non-diaphragmatic breathing, which pushes your tension levels even higher. 
throws off your physiology. I mean, there's books written about breathing disorders and the ramifications. The autonomic nervous system gets completely thrown off, but it limits your ability to rotate as you move forward. So if you don't have what we call a neutral neck, so that would be a th about 30 degrees of cervical lordosis, a curve in your neck. If you lose that, that is going to affect everything downstream. So what we are most concerned about in postural restoration is to get that curve back in someone's neck if they've lost it. But it's a whole body issue. It's not just the neck. It could be the, it could be the instability of the pelvis. It could be the lack of diaphragmatic breathing. It could be an, a visual system that's too constrained by the small rooms that we're forced to sit in without seeing expansion and horizons. It could be the stress that we're all under constantly. It could be, it could be, it could be, it could be. <laughs> Anything that creates tension. And when that tension is not resolved through like during COVID, tension, tension, tension with no way to resolve it because all your social activities got taken away. All the normal ways that humans unwind were removed and it's from other people. We lost contact with others. We don't regulate our own bodies as much as we think. And I've shown this on my, in my own YouTube videos, how I can change people's ranges of motion just by singing, by reciting a monologue and acting, by watching someone else walk to a beat, their ranges of motion change. There's so many neurological ways that the environment and other people regulate our systems. And once we can no longer uh, regulate that tension, once the tension levels go so high and they never come back down, Tension's fine as long as that tension can come back down into a cycle. So cycles of tension and detension, tension and detension. But once that tension stays too high, things start to break down and our breathing changes, our stability changes, our visual systems change, and we just become tight. And that, that becomes the problem. So there's a relationship between internal tension and external stressors then? Oh, gosh, yes. I will take away someone's ranges of motion so quickly by playing music that, you, that they do not like. I've shown this with, I'm a, I'm a salsa dancer. I've danced for 20 years. When I, and this is why I promote dancing so much. And there is a book called Dancing is the Best Medicine written by a neuroscientist. I highly recommend it. Dancing is a total brain integration activity. There's books written on the effect of music on the brain. Many of them. I'd highly recommend your brain on music. There's almost no part of your brain that's not functioning when music is playing. So music is the magic. I mean, there's books written on, there's, there's music therapy, there's dance therapy. The idea that music calms the nervous system, as long as you like it, is not novel. Right? That's out there. That's, but people don't know how to use it. And I don't think they can put it into perspective. But I know my salsa dancing friends are almost never in pain. And if they are, they're better in two sessions. Whereas the average, it's, it's funny because when I first started doing PRI, I was still teaching dancing, uh, you know, three or four hours a night. And I needed experience testing people and just working with them because I didn't know what I was doing when I found PRI. I was, I was a strength and conditioning coach, but this is way outside the realm of what you learn as a, as, a, as a personal trainer or anything like that. So I would just test everybody. And I would always find that salsa dancers would have better ranges of motion as long as they weren't, you know, people who could stretch themselves out really intensely, like they had just normal ranges, like they didn't have extreme flexibility because that can be problematic. They would just be less patterned, as we would say. Uh, and when I would start working with them, if they had pain, they got better so much faster. And I think, oh my God, this postural restoration thing is so amazing. It gets everyone better so quickly. And then when I started to work with more general population, it's like, wow, these people are <laughs> a lot tighter. <laughs> like I can't, I, I can't make the changes with these people that I can with the salsa dancers because rhythm relaxes the body. The moment your brain hears rhythm, the motor, the motor parts, the motor cortex starts to move. So I know for myself, if I'm reading, I will tighten up. If I, if I'm, if I'm reading too, for too long, I stand up, I can't touch my toes. But if I have music on in the background with a beat, because it's stimulating this, your vestibular system, your vestibular system, I get up with no tension. So music and dancing is a huge thing. Uh, in terms of getting that body and brain 
to relax. And unfortunately, I can't remember the original question because I started to go off on a tangent. <laughs> no, well, that, that's one takeaway, certainly from this episode. If you want to be a more fluid mover, if you want to increase your range of motion, yeah. well, then just to start salsa dancing and listen to music that you enjoy. You, that's, oh, uh, that's the important part. It has to be what you like. So if you're surrounded in an environment or you go to home to a, a home life or you have a job that's constantly stressing you out, that is creating tension in your body. Oh, that's how it, okay, yeah. So when I, when I show people what, the, what music can do, I can get them completely neutral very quickly in sense of the ranges of motion that they didn't have previously in their legs and their arms and their neck. I can get it back for them very quickly, but I can also take it away very quickly by making them hear music that they do not like. And they, they are all shocked by how quickly they lose the range of motion. So just think of noise pollution, like the jackhammers that are putting that all noise pollution is a huge, when you test people, when, when people come to see me from New York and they live in Manhattan or Brooklyn or where it's going to be, usually their testing is a little bit worse than the person living in the suburbs because there's, there's so much stress and tension that they don't even, they're not even aware of because it's just part of what, the, it's just part of their environment, but the environment and who you're around and the lack of movement <laughs> It all changes your physiology. It really does. And, and it, that's a big thing. And I remember the question now was, you know, how if your external stress and internal tension, yes, they are completely linked in ways that we really do not understand nor appreciate. But if someone's coming to me for help with, with hip pain and I can get them neutral and I can start to stabilize, like in terms of I can get them to pass the range of motion testing, which means their body has relaxed. Uh, I can start that restabilization process from a biomechanical perspective, but if they can't go home or go to work or whatever is going on in their life, if that tension levels are keep going up because of what's going on in their life, it may not, I might not be able to help them too much. So many people listening to this episode will suffer from headaches. Can you talk to us about the relationship between stress and tension in around the neck, because we were talking about the neck earlier uh, and the formation of headaches? So one thing that you have to keep in mind also is that a lot of, so you could think about TMJ, jaw issues. A lot of times there's a link between headaches and, and you know, overusing, grinding your teeth or you know, your oral cavity habits, let's put it that way. Because these big muscles, these big jaw muscles, the temporalis muscle, the masseter muscle and the, the lateral pterygoids and the medial pterygoids, these are these these muscles are all separate and they really control the jaw when there's I, i'm pretty sure i've seen studies where it's showing how these jaw muscles are overused in stressed out organisms meaning humans <laughs> so most dentists could actually say oh yeah when you're stressed it, you start to grind your teeth I, I think these are observations that people have been making for a very long time but could never put it together in a coherent, I don't want to even call it PRIA system. I call it an explanation of how right dominant humans deal and react to tension and stress. And thus how they stabilize and posture themselves, which is going to be over on the right side. The testing will show that the moment I put the music on that they don't like, the testing will once again tell me that this brain has decided to move to the right side. They haven't moved, but the muscle activation is reflecting right side activity. Once you actually understand what the tests, what the, what the mechanical tests are showing. So headaches, your neck, if you do not have 30 degrees of cervical lordosis, your neck is going to be overactive. A chiropractor could probably tell you that your neck muscles are going to be overactive because you've lost that cervical lordosis. Your jaw, the position of your jaw is directly impacted or influenced by the position of your neck. So if you fall into a forward head posture and now your jaw might actually move down and back slightly, or maybe even rotate to one side or the other, and now start to create cross bites and open bites and all these other dental issues. Now you've got improper contact. So you, most people, if I ask them where they sense their mouth or where they sense their teeth, most people say, oh, I sense my right molars more than my left molars. That's a completely normal answer because we're right dominant. So that's a normal answer, but that's going to create over time 
imbalances through the stomatognathic, this, this oral cavity structure, these, these muscles, these jaw muscles. And the jaw muscles will then start to pull on the cranium because the temporalis muscle attaches to the temporal bone and the sphenoid bone. Cranial sacral therapists could tell you this. Osteopaths could tell you this. This is, these bones do, the cranium has movement available to it. It's not, yes, it's sutured, but it's not, there is allowable movement to the cranium. And actually that's the biggest problem. When the cranium gets locked up because of stress or whatever it's gonna be, or a malocclusion or a jaw that's shifted or a bad bite or whatever it's gonna be, uh, that affects the rest of your system because now the neck stays tight. So there is a direct link between, uh, in my mind, uh, the, the neck that will influence the jaw and the jaw which can influence headaches. And that's just one way. And then you have all the muscles in the back of the neck, the trapezius muscles, the suboccipital muscles, those are all affected by a forward head posture also, which are now posteriorly rotating your head and jutting your head forward. And that's where all the cranial nerves come out of. So once the cranial nerves are being compressed, the vagus comes out of that area. Uh, once, the, once this important circuitry is being compressed, you can get a lot of different autonomic, autonomic nervous system issues. That's what it comes down to. This is all autonomic nervous system. Okay, so you're the you're the expert here. So what's the what's the answer then if somebody comes to you, for example, with uh, a forward jutting head position yeah. and uh, tight neck uh, and uh, pain and headaches and all the rest? What would your solution be, just in general terms, to help them overcome their 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 stress and their pain and their improper posture? So the I would say eighty percent of people that come to me have nothing really going wrong in their cranium. Their visual system is fine. Their jaw and their teeth are fine. Everything is kind of aligned properly and functioning properly above the, above the neck. So in that case, their forward head posture is simply generally coming from instability in the body, usually through that left hip and sometimes the right lower back, just being stuck on the right side too much. Uh, and so what we do as postural restoration, postural restoration therapists is getting them back onto their left side the left side that they're, they can't get onto because their pelvis won't turn to their left. Their neck won't turn to the left because they're stuck on the right side. So once they get the left side, and I've had people start crying immediately. I've had people uh, just feel this sense of euphoria because they're finally on their left. The brain finally senses the ground underneath that left foot. If, you're, if your center of mass is always slightly shifted to the right, your brain never fully feels the ground come up underneath the left foot. And your brain expects two. You have to have two sides. If you're only on one side, you're no longer, you can't move like a human. Every, the whole process, the whole movement and breathing apparatus, even though we are asymmetric, once, you, once that asymmetry becomes too asymmetric, once it goes outside its normal range of asymmetry, that's where things start to go wrong. All we're trying to do is get you back into a more normal state of asymmetry because you're never going to be symmetric. So does this mean then you must become more actively self-aware when it comes to using the left side of your yeah, body then? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, every posture restoration technique that people call exercises, but I don't like to use the word exercise because the moment you think of exercise, you're going to think of the gym. And that's not what this is. This is more of a neurosensory experience. This is a, this is a way to give your brain a different experience of your body in a relaxed state, because these people are already too tense. If you have them lift weights, they're just going to add tension upon tension. We're trying to detense the system, the body, so that you can finally get to your left side appropriately. And then once they build stability through that left hip and relearn how to get onto the left side. And this is where the, you can think of it as a more biomechanical, uh, situation, they do have to learn how to use their left hamstring, their left inner thigh, their left glutes, their left glute medius, their left abdominals, their left diaphragm. They have to, and that's what most PRI techniques are doing, is showing this brain, this individual, how to safely get on their left side, often in a position that's lying on the ground or with their feet on the wall, uh, in a safe way so that they don't have to deal with gravity. Because once they're standing up, if you try to do it when they're standing up and they're too unstable, they're just going to arch their back and use their neck because gravity is too threatening to them. So you start them off on the ground, let them learn how to feel a left hamstring, feel a left inner thigh in the right position with a pelvis and a rib cage and a neck that are all orienting to the left. 
you put them in that position, then they just have to breathe in that position. And their brain then relearns, it rediscovers what it's lost, which was the left side. So that's really, that's, so we work with muscles. At that point, we are really working with muscles, but it's still, we're changing the input. I'm getting that brain. I'm not changing the output. We, well, we do change the output, but without changing the input first, you're not going to get the outcome that you want. And if, and if you do not understand that people are not straight when they lie down on your table and you testing their ranges of motion, they are not straight. They might look straight, but you're only looking at the twists and compensations to keep them straight. Their bodies, their pelvis is still turned in this underlying pattern. It's going to be oriented to the right. You have to get that pattern biased. You have to bias them onto their left side to actually get to use their left side. You don't have to work. You, hard, you don't have to work harder to get your right side. You're already there. <laughs> you have to turn off the right side and bias the left side to actually use the left side. That's the important thing to remember. Even when you think you're straight to your brain, you're not because you still have that bigger right diaphragm and you still have a visual system and a brain that prefers to pay attention to the right side more than the left. So to get truly on your left side, whether you're weightlifting, if you're doing lunges or whatever you're doing, you actually have to turn your pelvis a little bit to the left. Otherwise, to your brain, it's still to the right because of this right dominance. Okay, you mentioned muscles there, which is good because I want to talk to you about the psoas. Mm -hmm. I also want to talk about low back pain. So many people out there suffering with low back pain. Yeah. Can you talk to us about the significance of this uh, right side dominance, the psoas muscle and low back and lower back pain? Yes. So this right side dominance is going to put the pelvis... So remember, your pelvis is connected to your lumbar spine, which is connected to your rib cage, which houses your diaphragms. So your your di and the muscle one of the muscles that attaches to the, the diaphragm is the psoas. So the psoas muscle itself is pretty much inseparable from the diaphragm. I even have a video on my YouTube channel which shows they're doing a dice. You can actually find the YouTube video. Uh, I think it's called the deep frontal line uh, dissection. But you see someone doing a dissection of some type, and he's tracing this, this line from the tibia, from the lower leg, all the way up to the tongue. And you can see how it's all connected. And when he gets to the psoas, and he's on the left side, when he's tugging on the left psoas, the diaphragm is moving at the same time. So they're completely connected, and you cannot, you cannot separate them. So when a pelvis is oriented to the right, because of this ingrained pattern that we're, that's inside all of us, the left psoas is usually a little bit overactive and it holds that the psoas playing a part in anterior pelvic tilt, if you want to think of it like that, is well understood. It pulls your lumbar spine forward, tips your pelvis forward. That psoas is connecting to the diaphragm. So if you're not diaphragmatically breathing with your left diaphragm, that psoas is going to have a very hard time to, to quiet down. And once you're in this position for too long, your back is overarched on one side. And it's going to be the left side. Now you might have pain on either side, but you're stuck in an asymmetrical position. So the forces on the spine are never getting to change because even when you put your weight on your left leg, your body is not fully going to the left. It's staying oriented to the right. So these compressive forces that occur in the lower back, if those compressive forces were able to alternate, just like your tension has to be able to alternate. Tension goes up and then tension goes down. Tension goes up, tension, that's how it should work. But when that system gets disrupted, now think about compression. If you put your weight on your right leg, your right side compresses into the ground. Your left side decompresses. You can't have compression going on both sides of the, of the body at the same time. If you do, you're stuck. It's like a computer program, you hang. It's not gonna work. You can't have two leaders. They have to alternate. So that right side will stay compressed, the left side will stay decompressed. If you can then get onto your left side, have the left side of the body compress and have the right side decompress, now that spine and lower back and pelvis can rotate in the opposite direction. You've just relieved your disc issues. You, got, you start to get disc issues because you're always stuck on one side. When people get, get diagnosed as having a, a scoliosis that they didn't have as a kid, and the doctors will often say, Oh, it looks like you have mild scoliosis. What they're likely looking at is this pattern that we've identified. That not, not me, that, that the founder of postration identified, that he calls this left AIC pattern. 
They're just looking at a body that's stuck on the right side. Get them onto the left leg, that spine will then go in the opposite direction. Because you have to have a wave. You need two sides that work together. If you only have one side, you don't have a frequency. You don't have alternation. You don't have compression and decompression. You only have one and on each side. They have to alternate, and that's what it comes down to. You talked about breathing there. How do we foster the correct breathing technique then? And this is what if you this is what I wish psych, like psychologists need posture restoration. <laughs> Cuz you can have someone try to diaphragmatically breathe all day long. But if they're because you that psychologist can say, oh, this person's stuck in a state of fight or flight. It's so obvious. They're all amped up. They're all tense. But their body is stuck in that position. It's not only the mental aspect of it or the psychological aspect of being tense. The amount of people who finally get onto their left side and they just feel so much more relaxed. They become ungrounded. That's a that's a word that you they use in psych in psychology quite often. The idea of someone who's you know uh, psychologically grounded or ungrounded. That's a real thing, but your body becomes ungrounded. So the on one side in particular, the left side becomes less grounded and the right side becomes too grounded. But you cannot diaphragm, remember, to improve your breathing, your right diaphragm is still probably working perfectly well for most people, but you need the left diaphragm in your life also. So to really improve your breathing, you have to be able to turn your pelvis to the left, turn your lumbar spine to the left, sense the ground underneath your left foot, your left heel in particular, so that your weight, your body can be centered over the non-dominant side and then breathe. And now you'll have a left diaphragm to go with the right diaphragm. And now the right side starts to relax because you're actually on your left side. So the whole system starts to work. The problem is when this asymmetry becomes too asymmetrical and you're only using one diaphragm. And if you're only using one diaphragm, you still need to breathe, so you're gonna to have to pick up the slack by using your neck, and that's now you're a neck breather. So it really is still gonna come down to this left side and right side being different. And people have to learn how to use their left side appropriately uh, so that they can then diaphragmatically breathe. So, so you can try every peer, you can try every breathing technique in the book, but without recognition of this, the difference between the left side and the right side, and how we preferentially use the right side because we center ourselves over the dominant right side you're not going to have, you might have some improvements, but I think it's going to, you're going to struggle to really fully resolve your issues. And of course it depends on how unstable somebody is. Some people, they're still intact. Like their, their left hip really didn't become unstable. Their, their, their body is relatively stable still. They can get better very, very quickly, but the more instability there is in a system, the more it has to tighten up in other places. And the more it has to tighten up to, to not fall down and to stay safe, the more you're going to neck breathe, the more you're going to lose your diaphragmatic activity, the more your tension levels are going to go up. So it's really whole, it's completely holistic. But it, it, so you have to, but again, you can, you can, you can influence that through what you're hearing, what you're seeing, put a lens on, put, change someone's glasses, change the prescription. Oh man, they might breathe much better because it changed their autonomic nervous system. Anything that changes your autonomic nervous system, any influence on the autonomic nervous system can change how someone breathes. So it can, so again, it can be your environment. It can be what's going on in the world. It could be the elections. It could be whatever stresses you out will change your physiology and it's going to change your breathing. That's why trauma is so bad. You get stuck with trauma, um, you know, PTSD, any type of traumas, whether it's big trauma or small T traumas that kind of accumulate over the, over your lifetime. That's going to affect your physiology. And once you start to neck breathe more because you're tense, you're not gonna stay balanced. You're gonna shift more to that right dominant side because that's where your brain, it's just, it's the path of least resistance. So there's no one thing you can do. It's, it really has to, there's a, different people need different things. Let me just put it that way. So there's no, and that's what people get a little bit upset on even on my YouTube channel with some of the comments. They don't like the idea that there's not one exercise you can do for every single person. Cause that's what we're trained to think like, oh, what's the one exercise to get rid of SI joint pain or the one stretch. It doesn't work like that. There's too many different components. And I know from my own personal history, cause I was a cranial patient, my visual system, my brain stopped using my left eye. My jaw was torqued to the right. I had a complete imbalance through my cranium. It was completely torqued and twisted. 
my lower body, the chronic pain that I was in, my ears started to ring at 14 years of age. Something was seriously wrong. I've lived it from really, it started to really get bad in my sophomore year in college. Uh, so when I was about 18 or 19, and then until I was 35, SI joint issues, neck spasms, shin splints, plantar fascia, I had it all. My lower body was never the problem, never. It was all my sensory processing because of the insults that went on through bad orthodontia for pe from people who did not result, who did not recognize an asymmetrical torqued cranium that should never have gotten orthodontia in that state because they just locked me into a aberrant state uh, from a visual system that was not working properly. That's what posture restoration is looking for. Other people do not, they don't consider that. They're not considering when you go to an orthodontist, they're just going to straighten, usually most, most are just going to, no, well, you're paying me to straighten the teeth, so I'll straighten the teeth but they're not checking the underlying structure of the rest of the body. If, you're, if your neck does not have 30 degrees of lordosis, you do not want to be changing your teeth because now it just might lock you into it. You want to try to get that lordosis back through stabilizing the pelvis, through uh, repatterning your breathing so that you can start to use your diaphragms. So your neck relaxes. And if that happens, your neck might get that 30 degrees back. It can happen really quickly. Now you're probably safe to get that orthodontia because your jaw will probably move also. So you don't want to lock yourself in to an aberrant, into a straight neck position because now you're going to be completely autonomically unbalanced. So it's amazing. We all seem to be perpetually in a state of compensation then, really, don't we? To one degree or another, yeah. And it just depends on how you can manage it, how you can... I really it's being aware that. of it. It's being aware of it in the yeah. first place. And that's what I'll take from this episode. It's actually being aware of how you position yourself, how you carry yourself. And yeah. as you said, most of us have a bias towards the right side. Yeah. So it's being aware that we need to uh, equalize uh, our, our how we sit and how we stand and how we move. So as we integrate the left side more so yeah. into, into how we move. Yeah, because as you're sitting there, you're probably sitting more on your right sit bone than your left that most people will be. Some people say, no, I feel my left more. I don't want to hear that because that's not a normal pattern. Because in my mind, then I say, wait a minute, why is this right dominant human with the right or bigger right diaphragm and a brain that likes to pay attention to the environment on the right side more than the left? Why are they on their left sit bone? They probably have a lot of compensation going on. That's not a normal answer. So someone might say, oh, I'm on the left side. I'm already good. Eh, I doubt that. <laughs> but just because because no one comes in testing on their left side. The tests all reflect someone who's oriented to the right. So if someone says, oh, I feel my left molars more than my right, or I feel my left sit bone or my left foot more than my right, on, on someone who's never done postural restoration before, and I know they're in this pattern, uh, I think to myself, oh, how'd that happen? I want you to be, I want a, someone to feel the right sit bone more because it's normal. I just want you to be able to use your left side again. But that's why music and dancing, the rhythm will put you back on your left side. If you walk, if you go for a walk with no music, you're going to spend too much time on your right foot because everything in your body is still oriented to the right when you're in this pattern. But if you put music on, your brain will entrain with, and if you can identify the rhythm, so you use four, four timing, one, two, one, two, or one, two, three, four. If you can find the rhythm and you time your heel strikes with the rhythm, that will relax your hip flexors in your neck so quickly because it's putting you back on beat. Someone who's oriented to the right and stuck in this pattern that PRI identifies, they're walking off beat. They're spending too much time on their right foot. And I believe I had an online um, client one time who was from, I think he was from the Netherlands. And I think he used to do speed skating. And apparently, don't quote me word for word on this, but I, it was just so awesome in my mind that he mentioned this, that there's something in speed skating, I think it was, where they call it mop leg, that one leg, and I think he mentioned the left, becomes almost unusable. That's the issue. That's the same. It's like a peg. Sometimes people will say, it like, my left leg just feels like a peg. Like, I put my weight on it, and it just pushes me back. A kickstand. That's the pattern. So music will change that very quickly because your brain, your internal metronome is broken because your pattern, you're too asymmetrical. Your brain will link up with the external beat and put you back on beat. And your body will relax very quickly if you can get your heels to hit with the beat. And all that research, you can find that on Parkinson's patients.
the effect of music on Parkinson's patients. Tons of research on that in the basal ganglia and all these other areas of the brain that are integrating movement and auditory cues. I mean, your brain doesn't know it's listening to music. It's hearing some sort of cue that your brain can cue in on. It's a pattern, a pattern of notes that your brain can then figure out how to move better because it's listening to this pattern, this, this cycle of patterned beats. And that's what we're talking about. Is pa- everything is patterns. It's all patterns. I absolutely love the holistic approach. I love the fact that uh, from a neurological standpoint, uh, it has a bearing on our ability to move and then uh, that will then determine whether we compensate or overcompensate in one area or another. I love the fact that uh, something as simple as awareness of where we position ourselves uh, has a has a bearing on things. And uh, I think my favourite part of, of this interview is the fact that music and, and movement and, and salsa can also bring a bread of freedom and uh, yes. uh, and and help with our movement. It's, it's just extraordinary, but it's all so common sense. It's at the so same common time. sense that no one thinks of it. It's so common. <laughs> most of the most falls for elderly happen while they're turning. So when they're in the home and they're turning around. Well, what is dancing? What is salsa? It's turning, 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 turning spinning it's all vestibular it's training your system to tr- to turn don't wait until you're 60. learn to dance when you're 20 and it will carry over because i know from teaching people the older they are the more off balance they are the more their brain is already patterned in how the, the longer they've been in a pattern of compensation it's harder for them to learn how to turn they never spin as, e- as easily as a younger person does. You could, you could chalk it up to athletic or just being younger, but I don't necessarily think that's just all it is. Uh, but when you learn how to spin and turn, well, that's what kids do when they're young. They spin, they turn, they throw, they throw things. We don't do that anymore. Even kids don't do that anymore because they're, they're like in, in the United States, so many people, they don't, they don't even have gym class anymore for a lot of these kids. They don't play music. The music programs are all cut out. If you want to read a great book about this, read um, "What Is Health," it, and he and, or any any of the books about like hunter gatherer societies. Read how they still live. The few that are still exist, they all sing, they all dance, they have community. All these things that the brain evolved to do, we don't do that much anymore. We use our brain to convey abstract information, and in the phylogenetic order of things. That was probably the last thing that we used our voice for was to convey abstract information. It was for bodily communication, for emotive emotion, for community expression. And when you don't have that, you you don't have two lives. You just have one life. Like you have one side of your body. All you do is work. So if someone goes to work and stares at a computer all day and then goes to the gym and lifts weights, they are really harming their neurological flexibility. They get tight and restricted. Their bodies will reflect that. And my salsa dancers, they're nice and relaxed. And I can change their ranges of motion and make that and help them feel better so fast because the rhythm is doing it for them. You're an absolute mind of information. I could uh, sit and listen to you talk at length for, for hours and hours on end, but uh, time, I think, has, has caught up with us. Okay. Neil, Neil Hallinan, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, what I will do is I'll pop your your links to your YouTube page in the show notes for this episode. And I would urge people to go and look at your videos because really, uh, to, uh, to a, a person, 99% of the comments are, are so encouraging and uh, they're really so impressive with the information and the knowledge and experience that you dispense. And as I said already, that you're all you're doing is dispensing common sense and you're drawing on that holistic uh, message again about the body really needing to do what it was designed and evolved to do, which we have basically forced it not to do in recent years and hence yeah. the result of so much compensation and overcompensation and so many problems with posture. And people will say, oh, this, is, this must be alternative no this is how humans exist and have existed for eternity that's what's so strange about it they think that because it's it's not a muscular based we do work with muscles but it's not a it's not a biomechanical system that we're dealing with but that's how it's thought of that's how we learn it as a biomechanical thing that's not that's the output that you're looking at you're not looking at the only way to change that output is by changing the input and the processing 
and our brains have to deal with threat and non-threat and what it likes and what it doesn't like. Think about how the human brain learns. Dopamine, learning reinforce, that's what we're talking about. Music stimulates dopamine. Dancing stimulates dopamine, as long as you're not nervous about dancing in front of people, that, that'll, that'll be a problem. <laughs> but, but, so it can work either way, it depends on the person. But like, it's all out there, it's just no one put, but when we think about the body, we're still thinking too biomechanically, and then everything else is foo-foo or new age. No, it's not, that's actually correct. It's not alternative. This is how the body and the brain actually exist. It doesn't exist as a biomechanical, bio, biomechanics are just a human label to try to describe a phenomena of movement. That's all, to me, that's all it is. But the only way you can well, would, biomechanics is by what's going into that brain. And that's neurosensory input. I would rather uh, take uh, uh, some salsa classes and listen, listen to some good music that I enjoyed and have a dance than uh, pop a pill, certainly. Neil, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much great. for joining me on the, on the podcast today. As I said, your mind of information. So, so much great advice there. And uh, we'll pop a, a link to your YouTube page uh, in the show notes for this episode. But for the moment, thank you so much, Neil Hallinan. My pleasure. Thank you.